Awesome. Okay, so this talk is going to be an overview of uh, ES 2015. Babel. Uh, this is my break timer. Everyone reach into the sky. <laughs> okay. Um, it's going to be an overview of ES 2015 and kind of the latest features in ECMAScript. Babel, ESLint, and Webpack. All of these things are basically prerequisites to even like getting started with a uh, like a generated U app. Um, so just to kind of get a feel for the room, who here has written a Webpack config from scratch? Okay. <laughs> okay. Who here has at least used an app that was running with Webpack config behind it? Okay. Um, and who here has configured Babel from scratch? A little bit. Okay. That's a who here has used an app that's using a Babel config under the hood? A little bit? Okay. Um, and, and the idea is like, so the, the Vue CLI is awesome. It's provided by Vue.js. It allows you to spin up a new Vue app, but there's a lot of stuff in there that it comes with default configuration, but you can go in and modify it yourself if, if you so desire. Um, what's next? I don't know. Oh, yeah, me. So I already introduced myself. <laughs> I am a, oh no, this is out of date. I'm a lead instructor. Lead instructor, senior full stack developer here at Galvanize. And I already described what Galvanize is. Um, all right, some object objectives for today. The first thing is kind of, we're going to kind of explore some of the newer features in uh, ES 2015 or ECMAScript, um, mainly because you're going to see these things all over the place in a Vue.js app. So when you're looking at a modern app, uh, written with modern features, you're going to come across a lot of this. So I'm just going to show some examples of it, um, and you'll be able to kind of decipher that stuff when you come across it. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to update the Babel config. So Babel is a tool that allows us to take the code written with ES 2015 and some of the latest features and transpile it so that it works in older browsers, and browsers that don't necessarily support some of these features. Um, we'll also talk about updating rules and adding and removing them from your ESLint RC. So ESLint is a tool that allows you to uh, check your code for various style rules. So you can add rules based on uh, using let var and const, uh, rules about the length of lines in your code, rules about variable names, uh, restricted characters you want to prevent from having variable names. There's tons and tons of rules, um, but when you generate a Vue.js app, you can actually uh, install it using the Airbnb uh, base rules. So Airbnb is a software company, and they created basically a base set of rules that they use in every project. And it's actually become very popular in the JavaScript community. So you can generate a Vue.js app that has that config added to it by default. But I'm going to show you how to turn off some of those rules or add some new rules. Um, because a lot of times, people end up just disabling it altogether just because it's so annoying. Um, but it, you should keep it enabled, but I'm going to show you how to just disable small things if they annoy you. Uh, and then the last thing is to uh, modify, update, and add plugins to the Webpack config. And really, all of this stuff revolves around Webpack. So Webpack is a module bundler. The idea being you have lots of different bu uh, modules in your app. So you have uh, view components. Those are modules. Um, you have images, Webpack considers those um, modules, images, videos, JavaScript files, CSS files, all the different types of files that make up your app um, can be considered as modules for Webpack. And what it does is it takes all of these disparate files and separate files throughout your app that talk to each other and puts it into a single bundle. Um, and so it'll spit out a JavaScript file, a CSS file, and then maybe uh, some images um, that could have been like resized or uh, optimized for the file size or something like that. But the idea is you're taking all of these files, running it through Webpack, and creating a single assets that you can use. Um, and really, all of these other things that I'm talking about, ES2015, Babel, the ESLint config, all of that has configuration that gets plugged into Webpack to ultimately generate your, your module. Cool. First thing I want to talk about is ES 2015 or 2016 or 2017 or ES Next, all of the latest cool features. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to generate a Vue.js app so we can play around in it. So let's do it in here. So Vue.js itself comes with a CLI tool. It's called the Vue CLI. And if we want to generate a new app, we say Vue init. 
And then you can specify a template. In my case, I'm going to specify a Webpack. Um, I believe they also have Webpack Simple, which is a lot less configuration, but not as configurable. Um, they also have an even more basic one that doesn't have Webpack. But the idea is if you're building a production level app, you're going to want all of this in included in your app. So you init Webpack, and then you can name your app. So I'm going to call this Explore the Config. So we're going to explore the configurations. Uh, we'll give it a name. That's fine. Um, explore the config. That's me. I'm going to choose uh, runtime and compiler. Uh, no view router for now. Use ESLint to lint your code. Yes. And then it will ask you, do you want to use the standard preset or Airbnb or configure it yourself? I'm going to choose Airbnb, and I'll show later on how we can customize that. Uh, for now, I'm not going to add any tests. And that generated the app. So in this folder, I now have explore config. And we can go in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and install the dependencies. And I'll open this directory inside of Atom. CJ, do you have a preference with like, NPM or YARN using these um, things? So the latest version of NPM behaves very similarly, similarly, sim, similar, similarly <laughs> to YARN in that it creates a package lock. It um, installs from the cache. So like version 5 and above of NPM is starting to behave more and more like Yarn. So I've, I, I, used, I used Yarn for a while, but I've reverted back to using NPM. Okay. And you'll notice it created that package lock and then uh, finished the install. Cool. So I've got my dependencies. Um, in this folder, if I do NPM run dev, I'll just get a basic view app running with a Webpack dev server. That should open up in my browser. There we go. Got a basic view app. Um, but the things I want to talk about first are uh, common JS modules. So if you're not familiar with ES2015 modules, it's a way of uh, writing your JavaScript in separate files and then bringing specific files into a, a, a single file so that you can use features of other files. Um, it's basically, if you're, if you're familiar with uh, Node.js and Express, it's like require and module.exports, but in the browser. It's not currently supported by, I think, most major browsers, but eventually it will be. Um, and right now, we have to run our code through Babel to get it to work. But let's see where that comes into play. So if we look at our Vue.js app that, got, that gets generated, you'll notice first that there's a lot of stuff over here on the left. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Like, what is all of this, and, and what do we do with it? Um, but first, if we look in the source directory, we can look at main.js. This is the entry point into our Vue.js application. Basically, this is what creates the app and uh, gets it up and going. But you'll notice up at the top, there are these import statements. And what this is doing is this is bringing in the Vue.js library. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Node.js and Express, this would be equivalent to something like uh, const view equals require view. So this is a way of bringing in the module that you installed with NPM known as view and storing it in the variable called view. Um, this syntax import will eventually be, su be supported in all browsers. So you can, if you get used to using this over like require, that's a good thing. Um, but what this allows us to do is separate our files into well, our app into separate files. So this next line, import app from app, you'll notice that this has a relative file path. So what this is saying is this file wants to bring in the contents or the thing that was exported from the file in this folder called app. So right here, I have app.view. This is kind of like my, my main Vue.js component. But if we look in here, you'll notice this export command. And what this is saying is when somebody imports this file, they're going to get this exported object. Um, and later on, I'll talk about the whole Webpack pipeline and how this gets created. But basically, this is exporting a view component that has this as the template. Um, and this as the styles for that component. But this export command is basically saying this object is now available to anything that imports it. And so in this file, that app variable is now equal to the app component. But with CommonJS modules, basically we can do this everywhere. So if I go into app.view, you'll notice that it's importing the hello component. And this is a relative file path. So if I look at components and then hello, Hello is a view component that is exporting this object. Um, 
But when it gets imported into here, this variable is exactly equal to that component. So this idea of importing and exporting is a way of, instead of having everything as a global variable, we can specify, OK, there's something in that file. Bring it into this file in this specific variable, and then I can use it inside of this. Um, questions or comments on that? Cool. Um, I have some links over to um, Mozilla Developer Network. It shows some other examples of how you might do this. Um, the syntax that we're seeing is import some name from some module. And that's actually where the default keyword comes into play. So because this says export default, that means this is the default export. If I don't specify a name when I'm importing it in, this is what I'm going to get back. So over here, when I'm importing app, that means I'm getting the default thing. I'm getting that object. Awesome. Um, and I also have this link over to the uh, ES6 features repo. All the things I'm going to talk about and more are linked here with examples. So if we click on modules, um, you can see some examples of like exporting a specific function, uh, exporting a variable, uh, importing everything that was exported from another file, um, importing using destructuring, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but this is a really great resource to kind of see some examples of all these things that I'm talking about. Um, the next thing is classes. So um, classes are a way of creating a JavaScript constructor function, but using more of like the familiar OOP keywords and style. Um, so in this example on MDN, this is creating a class called rectangle with a constructor. And then later on, you can create an instance of that rectangle stored in a variable uh, and do something with it. Um, but you'll see this in a lot of places. And typically, I like to create classes to do something that holds like a reusable functionality. So I'm just going to create a quick class. I'm going to do it in here. And then we'll, we'll export a module. We'll import it. It'll all come together. So when I build my view apps in my source directory, I like to create a folder typically called like lib. So lib stands for library. This is anything that's going to be reusable throughout the application. So right in here, I'm going to create a new file. Uh, and let's call this uh, api.js. So this is going to be a library that makes API requests. And then I'm going to import this into my component and make some requests with it. So in here, I'm going to create a class called api. Not peppy. API. <laughs> cool. Um, and you actually, you can see my uh, ESLint config uh, kicking in. Um, this first one, API is, de API is defined but never used. The way I can make it use is if I export default. So basically, I'm saying the default export of this file is going to be this class that I create. Um, now, what is this comp uh, complaining? Useless uh, constructor. <laughs> you calm down, Linter. OK, so um, let's do some stuff. So in the constructor, I'm just going to set like an API URL. Um, I am going to get cat GIFs. I believe I have the Jiffy API. Yes, this is the Jiffy API. OK. So right here, my API URL is going to be that. And then this class is going to have a function on it called uh, git, git jiffies. Um, and this will, will accept a search term. And here, we're going to make an API request. So I'm going to use fetch, which is built into the browser. So say fetch. I'm going to pass in the URL that I want to use this.api URL. You'll notice that this URL had like a search term on the end. So before it was cats. But in this case, I want it to be dynamic. So I'm just going to throw the search term right there. Um, however, I will, on my list of things to talk about is template strings. So I'm going to go ahead and use them right here. So the idea of a template string is instead of concatenating strings, you can use template string syntax to make the code a lot more readable uh, and less, less verbose. So this exact thing written as a template string would be written like this. So first, wrap the whole thing uh, in backticks. Get rid of the concatenation. Throw a space there. Any variables need to be wrapped with uh, curly braces and a dollar sign, and then curly braces and a dollar sign. So this right here is exactly equivalent to the line above it. Now, in this example, it's not 
it's not that verbose, like we're not saving that much code, but there are a lot of cases where you're concatenating like five things together and you have like lots of variables and this really, really comes in, comes in handy and it keeps your code looking clean. So, and actually I don't want to space there because I want this to be API URL and then the search term tacked on to the end. Of it. Okay, so make the request and then uh, part of the fetch API is you have to turn it into JSON and then we'll use this function uh, in, our, in our component. So I've created a class here. I'm now going to import this class into my component so that I can use it. So over here, let's just do it in, let's do it in the hello component. So right here inside of my script, I want to import the class that was exported. So I'm using module syntax. So I'm gonna say import API from, and in this case, I need a relative path. Um, so, Actually, I don't. I can use uh, the at symbol. So I can do at slash lib slash API, I believe. And this will require the file that was, uh, the, the class that was exported right here. Now I want to use it. So inside of my hello component, I'm going to create, uh, let's just do, let's do some methods and I'll create a load method. So in your Vue.js component, methods, uh, basically like your controller, like you can put any function on here and this function can run and modify anything on the data that will be reflected in the view. So in here, I'm just gonna throw a load method. Um, when the app loads, I'm going to create an instance of the API. So we'll say API equals new API. And then I'm going to call that, that method. So api.get jiffies. And I'm gonna pass in the search term, in this case, cats. And then we're going to get back some result. And for now, I'm just going to log it out to the console. Uh, my ESLint config is complaining. It wants parentheses around that. Um, console logs are a warning. It wants a trailing comma, which I'm going to show how to turn off very soon. Cool. Um, the last thing is uh, you can tap into the uh, mounted event. So when a component is mounted, or when this component is mounted, please call the load function. Cool. So now when the app loads, it's going to import this class that I created over here. In the load function, we're going to create an instance of that class. We're going to call the get jiffies function, and then we're going to log out the result. Is it going to work? I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> um, dev tools? Break. Everyone reach into the sky. <laughs> it's working. I see it. It's working. <laughs> Cool, yeah, so you can see I have some, some warnings here, but if, if we refresh the page, here I get the object, it has a data property, those are all, those are all the jiffies. Um, the main thing that I wanted to show here was first class syntax, right? So uh, the fact that right here we're creating an instance of that API, that's because class syntax is basically just syntactic sugar for creating a JavaScript constructor function. So over here, the class, this is kind of like a blueprint, like, when you want an API, it's going to have these functions. And then over here, in this component, I create an instance of it and then actually use the function that's on it. Um, so that's class syntax. Um, yes, arrow functions. So you'll notice right here, there's this nice little fat arrow. Um, just a quick survey, who here has used arrow functions? Who here has heard of them but doesn't really? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll show a few ex different examples that you might see. So um, right here, this is like one of the most basic uh, arrow functions. So it accepts one parameter um, and then just does a console log. Uh, but this is exactly equivalent. Well, not exactly, um, but you can think about it in this way. This is equivalent to a function that accepts result as a parameter and then does something with the result. Now my linter is complaining because the Airbnb config says you should always use fat arrow functions, um, but I'm just showing an example of what that would look like. Um, so fat arrow, uh, in its most basic terms, is kind of a syntactic replacement for function. However, it's more than that, uh, because a fat arrow does not bind this. So it has a lexical this binding. What does that mean? Well, let's say over here on my data, I had something like uh, an array of jiffies just an array. 
Um, and then in my component, let's say I just create a bunch of these. So, uh, yeah, so I'll have a div, and I want to repeat this div for every GIF in my Jiffy's array. So I'm going to say GIF, the hard G in Jiffy's. Um, and right there, I'm just going to throw an image. I'm going to bind the source to be GIF dot something. i got to figure out what it is. Uh, but we are still logging it out. Let's see what the actual image URL is. So we go uh, GIF dot uh, URL? No. Content URL. I want like the I want to be able to embed the GIF on the page. So <laughs> GIF dot images. <laughs> oh wait wait wait. Embed URL. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I think this. We'll 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 try it. So we'll we'll try we'll try uh, URL. So just GIF dot URL. Let's try it. So GIF dot URL. Um, that should show the GIF. Right. But initially, when the page load, Jiffy's is just an empty array. But when I get the data back, uh, and what's it called? Result.data. So right here, I want to say this.jiffies equals result.data. So when I get that data back from the API, I'm going to set it on my data to be that array. And now we should see a bunch of GIFs on the page. And we see them, but they don't work. Uh, let's, let's get a. Let's do uh, gif dot images dot fixed width small dot URL. Okay, uh, I think I can do something like this. Copy property path, and then over here, cool. But instead, I just want to do gif. So gif dot images dot fixed width small URL. There we go. Nice. That's, that's too tiny though. Let's do. Uh, Fixed height. Yeah, nice. sweet. <laughs> um, but the reason I was doing this was because of lexical this. So if we look at this function right here, I'm saying this.jiffies. If I were to write this as a function instead of a fat arrow function, the function would have a different this value. So by using the fat arrow, I don't have to, to do the, the song and dance of like, uh, var uh, self equals this and then set self inside the function now I can directly access this because this inside of the load function is exactly equal to this data object so that's why this just works by default if I try to use uh, the actual uh, function way of doing it actually I think my linter will stop me uh, oh no actually I could turn it off but let's say I try to do this this will not work um, I'm going to show you something. Don't do this. Like, you should update your ESLint config. So what you can do is ESLint uh, dash disable, and that will turn that'll turn the linter off for that any lines below this. Don't do that. Update the config. I'm going to show later how to update the config. But now, because I'm using a function instead of a fat arrow, nothing happens. And you're wondering why is nothing happening? The function is creating a new value of this. Like, it's not the same this. So what you could do is you could say, like, const self equals this. And then uh, inside of here, you say self dot jiffies. Because now the this is equal to the this of the outside. <laughs> and now it works. Um, but save yourself some lines of code. And about, well, like, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Save yourself a line of code and eight characters to just do it as a fat arrow. Um, and you see fat arrows like a lot, especially like in React code as well, because the same thing is happening. Like in here, we want this to be equal to like the component itself. We don't want to overwrite it, so you'll see fat arrows in a lot of places. Um, one thing you might also see is a fat arrow without any body at all. So a fat arrow written like this has a single return value. Um, and then this is saying uh, no parentheses if I'm using a single line. If, or is it? Oh, assignment. Doesn't matter. Phil! Ah, Welcome. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
this this does this this as a single line function doesn't make as much sense in this context. But what this allows you to do is create a single function that returns a single thing. And actually, am I doing it in here? Yeah, I'm doing it in here. So this is a function that returns the value resolved by that function invocation right there. So by leaving off the body of the function, it's an implicit return. I can just leave off the return value, like the return statement as well. Um, yeah, so it's super handy. Not really in this case, though, so I'm going to keep it with a body. CJ? Yes, sir. Um, I don't know how much you want to get into. Do you want to talk about like, the difference between like, using created or mounted or like, when you go about doing those things? Oh. I mean, not really a topic of this, but, right. but, I, but I will say mounted is called every time the component is loaded. So like, if you have a component used, like the same component used in multiple places, right. mounted will get called every time for every single one of those. Okay. Created, I believe, is only called once when that component is like the first time that it's created. Okay. So um, that's why I like to tap into mounted, because basically if there's like a route change or something like that and the component reloads, this will always get called. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So that's Fatteros. What else? Template strings. I showed those. Um, yeah. Let's let's look at the, the documentation for them. So it, it gets a little bit deeper than that. So um, in its most basic form, you can do this by like having an embedded ex expression inside of the curly braces. Um, but you can also have tagged template strings, which basically work like functions. Um, so Yeah, so you can you can create this tagged template string that does this, but whenever you run this code, it actually invokes your my tag function, which accepts uh, the strings from inside of the template. The I guess it's the oh, and then the, like the expression, like each individual expression that was passed into the template string. So in this case, you know exactly how many. Uh, expressions are being passed in, but potentially you could get access to like arguments or something like that and access the arguments dynamically. Um, but it's a way of like running your template function through some other function. Um, main use though is to get rid of all of this concatenation. So right, like previously you would have had to done have done this. Like, okay, we're taking a string, we're concatenating it with some math. So we wrap that in parentheses, concatenating it to another string concatenating that to some math, so we wrap it in parentheses, and then concatenating a string. Whereas, um, yes, 15 is a plus b, and 2 times a plus b. You get rid of all that extra syntax, all those extra quotes, it's a lot easier to read, a lot easier to parse. Awesome. All right, destructuring. Uh, this can be a bit of a mind bender, but it's really fun. Um, so let's look at, see what uh, examples they have. Okay, you, you'll, you'll might, you might see a lot of examples like this where they're basically destructuring an array into variables. I don't like that as much. Like, I mean, you can use it for that, but to really see the power of this, um, this might be an example. So what this is saying is get AST node is a function that returns an object that has any number of properties. Like it's returning an object with a bunch of properties on it. But we specifically only want these three properties. And by writing your code like this, this is going to give you three variables in this scope called op, LHS, and RHS that you can use in the lines below it. Um, I realize that's also not the best example. Let's, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's do something. OK, so here, here's something I'd like to do. So in my API, I'm using fetch, but I am, uh, uh, I'm doing this res.json. If you ever use the fetch library, you'll find yourself doing this pretty much all the time because it doesn't, uh, not the fetch library, like just, it's built into the browser, the fetch API. Um, if you find yourself using it, you're doing this a lot. So I typically like to create fetch helpers that kind of do this under the hood. So let's do that. So in my lib folder, create a new file. Let's call it fetchhelpers.js. Uh, and right in here, I'm going to have a function called uh, fetchjson that accepts like a URL and then just does this. This. But now instead of that, URL. Um, and so now, anywhere that I want to fetch JSON, I can just say fetch JSON. 
but I need to import it. So first thing, my linter is complaining. It's defined but never used. What I can do is just say export. But I don't want to um, prefer default export. No. No, I don't. Uh, OK. Um, Well, I guess it's saying that because I don't have multiple functions. So let's just do this. Um, fetch other JSON, whatever. Um, just, to, just to turn the linter off. Um, but, but the idea is, so this is now a module that exports two functions, fetch JSON and fetch other JSON. If I want to get access to fetch JSON over here in API, I need to import it. But to import it, I'm going to use destructuring. So I'm going to say import brackets fetch JSON from fetch helpers. And what this is saying is fetch helpers exports multiple things. So because it exports multiple things, it's actually exporting an object that has multiple properties. But when I throw this destructure on it, it says, okay, this exports an object, but I only want the property fetch JSON. So now inside of this file, I have a variable called fetch JSON that I can use. Should behave exactly as before. But now uh, we're using a little helper library. What's it complaining about? Cannot read property then of undefined. Return. Cool. Um, so that's that's destructuring. It's probably a better way to demonstrate it. Uh, check out check out the docs though. So I, I I linked over to MDN. I also linked to ES6 features. Um, let's just look at let's see what MDN has to say about all this. Okay. Yeah, these are like super weird examples, but let, let's just explain what's happening here. So we first we declare a variable called x equal to that entire array. And then we destructure it. So basically what this is saying is the first value inside of the thing on the right-hand side is going to be put into a variable called y. The second value of the thing on the right-hand side is going to be put into a variable called z. And so now y is equal to 1 and z is equal to 2. If we put a bunch of other variables in there, it would basically assign each of these values to that variable. So it's a way of taking something on the right-hand side and just pulling out the things that we actually care about. Um, in this specific case, we've created a variable that has uh, strings inside, uh, an array that has strings inside of it. But by doing this, we now have three variables, one, two, and three, that have the values one, two, and three inside of them. Um, yeah, and like this, this is weird too. Why would you do this? Okay, um, var a and b, left hand side, we're saying destructure a and b to be this array of 1 and 2, and that actually puts the values 1 into a and, and 2 into b. Um, I don't know. When it comes to like to new, new language features, a lot of them are fun and like make the code easier to read. This, I would have to look at the docs like, what, what is happening here? Oh, OK, so like it's destructuring it. Like This is the same as var a equals 1, new line var b equals 2. Why would you not just write that? Yeah. Ah. So, and, and this is saying this is a, a stage three proposal. So, uh, when I talk, well, yeah, when I talk about Babel, I'll talk about like what the different stages mean. Uh, but what this is saying is uh, store the value of A in a variable called A, store the value of B in the a variable called B, store everything else in an object called rest. So, the, the uh, well, it would just be uh, C and D. So anything that um, wasn't defined, like wasn't specified over here, is going to get put into this object. So this is going to be a variable called rest. Well, it's an object called rest that has two properties, C and D. Yeah. Weird. But I will say the main place that you're going to see this is like in import statements uh, in your components. Um, mainly because components can export multiple things, and you only want specific things from the components. Awesome. Yeah, and lastly, method definition. So you've already seen me do this, but it's actually new. So if we look in uh, the component definition, well, let's look at the hello component. 
right here, so this whole thing is an object. Data is a property on that object. But you'll notice, I just have to put the parentheses. So if, if, if you're used to writing like older JavaScript, this actually should be written like this. So data is a property, which is a function that does that. And mounted is a property, which is a function. Uh, but the new uh, method definition syntax lets us just leave that off. Means exactly the same thing. It's just a little, little easier to write. Um, same thing would happen here. Like this would be, so methods is an object. Load is a property on that object that is a function. But we can pull that off and it just works for us. Um, that's one that's just purely syntactic sugar, but it uh, is really awesome and you should use it. Cool. I think that's enough talking about ES2015. Any last things you'd like to hear or any um, anything that came up? No? Okay. Take a drink of water. Awesome. So, who here is not familiar with Babel? Raise your hand. Cool. Babel, the compiler for writing next generation JavaScript. So, I just demonstrated a lot of new features in, in JavaScript. A lot of these features aren't actually supported in browsers. So, in order to actually run our Vue.js app inside of a browser, we have to run our code through Babel which will make our code runnable inside of uh, older browsers, uh, in browsers that don't support those features. Um, so uh, just like I was showing, like this is exactly equal to this. When we run our code through Babel, it turns our code into this so that the browser actually understands what we're writing. Um, and so with Babel, there are tons and tons of plugins that allow you to use all of these different features inside of your app. Um, wait. Yes, so if we're looking at the root of the Vue.js app, this Babel RC file, that is where all of our configurations are stored. So if we look at the root here and I look at Babel RC, these are the default configurations for Babel inside of this Vue app. What this is saying right here is we're using the ENV preset. So the ENV preset uh, comes by default with all ES2015 features and um, a select few like ES2016, ES2017 features. But just by including this preset, you automatically get access to all of those features. But I'll show where you can see that. So if we look on the Babel site at preset ENV, um, yeah, and this also has the, the ability to target specific browsers. So you'll notice here this says browsers, uh, greater than 1%, last two versions, not IE less than version 8. So what this says is any browsers that fall into this category, which is really more like uh, the most modern browsers, so like the latest version of Chrome, the, late, like the latest two versions of Chrome, the latest two versions of Firefox, um, the latest versions of the browsers that are actually supporting a lot more of these features, by specifying this, it actually transpiles less of the code. So if a browser already supports a feature, there's no need to actually run it through the transpiler. So by doing this, less of our code gets transpiled and can benefit from the optimizations in the browser. Um, but all of this is configurable. So if you do want to support like IE8 and below, you can go in and if you look at uh, Babel's uh, documentation, it'll tell you like what you can put in here to support those older versions. And by doing that, um, your code will probably be a little bit larger, but you will support older browsers. Um, the other thing is, uh, if you're familiar with the Kangax compatibility table, um, this is a table that describes all of the new features in ES2015 um, and which browsers support them. So right now, Chrome has 97% per per support of all of these features. Um, really, the only thing it's missing is uh, tail call optimization, and I believe, I don't know if it supports modules, maybe it supports modules. Um, but along the top here is all the different JavaScript runtimes or browsers, and then which features of ES2015 they actually support. So by specifying a specific browser, 
uh, Babel will look at this table and decide which, uh, which rules it needs to bring in to actually transpile your code. Um, let's see, do they have a list of plugins? They don't, but we'll see it on some others. But the idea is uh, Babel works through plugins. Um, if you put no plugins in Babel, Babel it'll look... Bagel? I don't know. It, it, it'll literally take your code and just give your code right back to you. But once you once you put plugins, it looks for things and decides, okay, when I see that, I need to transform it into this other code. Um, so if we look at the uh, maybe the stage two preset, um, yeah. So this is a collection of these two different plugins. So. Um, Real quick, let's talk about the different stages. Let's pull this in right here. OK, so um, I've been talking about ES2015. The idea is that every year, ECMAScript, which is uh, a standards organization, and their standards body, TC39, Technical, Technical Committee 39, once a year, they release the latest specification of the JavaScript language. Um, and that latest specification describes all the new features that JavaScript should support. So browsers will take this specification and start to implement it so that you can write code that speaks that can use the things in that spec. But there are various stages. So uh, stage zero is known as straw man. So basically, this is just an idea. Um, the, idea the, the idea is that somebody says, OK, it would be really cool if JavaScript did this. But it has like no backing yet. There's nobody's implemented it yet. Um, there are no companies backing it. They're just saying this would be cool. Um, stage one is a proposal. So this means somebody had an idea for a new language feature in JavaScript. They've written a proposal that describes how it might work, um, but it's not a, a draft or a specification just yet. Stage two means they have a draft. So they have a working draft that basically when it potentially gets approved, that draft would get incorporated into the actual specification. Um, stage three is a candidate, meaning complete specification is no longer a draft, and a few browsers have already started to implement it. So while like a browser like Chrome doesn't have to wait for the specification to actually be released, they can just say, all right, we want to support uh, async await, so we're just going to do that. Once multiple browsers have already tested it and implemented it, that is when something moves into stage three. And then lastly, when it's stage four, that means that in next year's release of ECMAScript, that stuff will be included. Um, but each of these different stages has various language features that you might want to use in your app. So by including one of these stages, you're getting all of the transforms that would allow you to use those things in your, in your JavaScript. Um, yes. By default, you're getting the ENV preset and the stage two preset. So by default, you have access to all ES2015 features and then all of the stage two proposals on up. So stage three proposals as well. Uh, stage four means it's already in the specification. Um, if we're looking at this, by default, we're using those presets, nothing more. If you see specific plugins on the Babel site that you want to use, you simply just add them to this array. So you just throw them in there. You have to NPM install them first, but that allows you to use those features uh, in your app, and the transpiler will know what it, what it sees when it comes across those things. Um, yeah, I think I have them listed here. But there are a few others. Like If you want to specifically tap into ES2017 features, um, or features of React, which supports things like JSX, or Flow, which supports like type annotations. You can bring those presets in, and Babel will understand your code. Awesome. Um, yes, including and excluding specific presets. So let's say, like by default, we're using ENV and Stage Two. But let's say there's like one specific uh, preset, well, one specific plugin in those presets that I don't want to use. You can specify, um, hey, where'd it go? Include and exclude. So here I could turn off uh, method definitions, or I could turn off module syntax if I really wanted to. Um, but that just makes it so that you, you can't use that in your app. All right. That's mainly all I wanted to talk about with the Babel config. I think the main thing is um, if you know where the file is, like 
you know, this is the config, this is where you can modify it. If you peruse the Babel site, you can look at specific plugins, you can see the things you may want to enable or disable. Um, every single plugin has specific documentation on how you might enable that thing. So if we click on this, it gives you some examples and then some usage. So you install it like this, you add this to your plugins, and then now you have access to that plugin uh, throughout your app. Any questions or comments about Babel? Yeah. So as a bit of a rookie, and I don't use any front-end frameworks and stuff yet, is that just JavaScript and ECMAScript uh, ideas in general that Babel will, like, like could I use that if I notice that something I'm, I've built already doesn't work in it, uh, i.e., I, I can run it through Babel and potentially could fix that issue? Yes, sir, yeah. Right now without... Oh, no, absolutely, yeah, so, and because really, what, what I'm showing right now is, like, by default, this thing comes configured with Babel, but if you look at the getting started on the Babel website, like, you could have a very simple front-end project that just runs, like, a few JavaScript files through this, and then they would be supported in older browsers. Um, but, yeah, if you do, like, well, I think try it out as, like, an inline REPL, so you could actually, like, write your code over here, so something like uh, var, and then apple, well, let's say var name, equals an object that has a name property, CJ. Okay, quick check for understanding. Based on destructuring, what is going to log to the console when I do name? Raise a hand. It won't be an object. So. Uh, and, and, but I, I like that you said that, though, because this is where destructuring can look tricky. So the idea is if you see these curly braces on the left-hand side of the equal, it's not creating an object. It's pulling properties out of the object on the right-hand side and creating those variables. So name is actually just equal to CJ. So does it? Oh, yeah, it's logging in. <laughs> <Great question. laughs> no, but uh, so it's actually doing that. And on the right-hand side... When, when this code was, so on the left-hand side, this is modern code. This is using destructuring. On the right-hand side is the code that actually gets generated. So this says, okay, var name equals uh, that, and then name is equal to name.name. .name. So if we were writing it from scratch, that's exactly what we'd, we would do. We would, we would say, like, var um, object equals that, and then var name equals object.name. So with destructuring, this is exactly what was happening. Yeah. Um, before you just did that, I, I saw the uh, the underscore name. I've seen that. Is that just a naming convention? I've seen that a lot in C sharp stuff and other things I've seen. Just a regular like naming convention. Yeah. So in, in something like C sharp, it's typically a naming convention for like private variables. Right. Um, this might be a naming convention Babel uses for like variables that it generates okay. because like my original code didn't have this variable, right. so it had to create that. So it like used underscore. Okay. Um, yes, cool. yeah, but I guess to, to the question that you were asking, um, yeah, you can go to setup, let's just say I'm using in the browser, this will give you exactly how to use it, like bring in their script tag, um, oh wow, that's actually pretty awesome, you don't even have to uh, transpile it, you could write a script tag that says Babel, and that will actually transpile it in the browser itself, you don't have to run it through the CLI or anything like that, yeah. Wonderful. All right. Moving on. Favorite part of all of this, ESLint. Cool. <laughs> um, so all of your ESLint configurations are stored in eslintrc.js. So when I, sh when I generated the app, you saw that I answered the question, which do you want to use ESLint and which uh, pre uh, presets do you want to use? So if I look at eslintrc, we can actually see this extends Airbnb base. Air Airbnb base. So by default, I get all of the rules defined inside of that uh, Airbnb base. Now, let's just check out the uh, ESLint website. If we look at rules, there are tons and tons and tons and tons of rules. Um, so there's like no undefined... Yeah, no undefined variables. So this is a really common rule. Um, the idea is if you use a variable that was not defined before, ESLint will throw an error. And this is like a really common error in JavaScript. Um, so like maybe you misspell a variable name or like 
you, I mean, that's probably the most common case. You misspelled something, which means that thing doesn't actually exist. So this rule will kick in and say, hey, that variable is not defined. Uh, just as an example of that, like let's say right here inside of API, right here, I just try to log wow. You'll see the linter error right here. Wow is not defined. No undefined variables. Um, and one thing I haven't shown is if you have a linter error, your uh, your view app just won't run. It'll actually it'll show the error and say, hey, you need to fix this. No undefined variable. Um, are you laughing at the gifs? Or? <laughs> oh, fix, fixes. Yeah, and, and uh, it's working on your behalf. But let's say I'm smarter than you, ESLint config. Don't tell me about no undefined variables. Um, so you can change that. So if um, the first thing I'll say is you should have ESLint plugin installed inside of Atom. So that's what's actually giving me these underscores and these, these errors down here. So if you go to install and just search for uh, ESLint, this package, linter ESLint, automatically detects your linter file and then throws those errors inside of Atom. So super convenient. Keep that enabled. Um, but let's say I don't care about no undefined variables. So I can go into my ESLint RC. Down here at the bottom are all of the rules. And no undefined variables is actually predefined inside of Airbnb base. But if I want to overwrite it, I simply just have to put it in rules. So right down here, I'll say the rule name, so no undef. And I'll just right now just say zero. And that turns the rule off. That says, if I'm violating this rule, I want no error at all. And so now, when I come over here, I'll have to reopen the file, but now it's not complaining anymore. It's totally fine. Hard refresh. Oh, uh, I have to rest like if, if you update your ESLint config, you have to restart uh, your view app because that will reload the linter file, the, the configuration file, so it knows about the latest rules. So now it's not complaining anymore, but my app is broken because I'm trying to log an undefined variable. And like, and then I actually get an error, wow, is not defined. Um, so that is one that you definitely shouldn't turn off. So I'll, <laughs> I'll re-enable that. Um, but there are a few that are like, um, yes, trailing commas. <laughs> so, and that's one thing I was gonna show. So if you, if you look in this component, uh, one of the Airbnb linter rules is that objects need to have trailing commas. So if I get rid of that, missing trailing comma. If I get rid of that, missing trailing comma. If I get rid of that, missing trailing comma. I don't care about trailing commas. They're, like, my code looks fine without them, um, and so I could turn that off. But because I took those out, now my app won't even run. Now I get this missing trailing comma error. But if you look at the actual error, you'll see the name of the rule comma dangle, so it's a dangling comma, comma. <laughs> um, but that's the name of the rule you need to use in your ESLint RC. So if I go over here and I say, I don't care about no comma dangle, zero, save it. Well, I'd have to restart the, uh, start the app. But now I can build my view components without those dangling commas. Yay, yeah. yay, <laughs> cool. Um, but the, the main thing here is like if you if you see a linter rule being thrown, like your your app just stops working, and you're like, hey, my code's fine, you can actually disable that rule. Um, and the idea is by default, all of the rules inside of here get enabled, but you can turn them off one at a time. Um, the other thing you could do is if you set this to one, it becomes a warning instead of an error. So, or maybe set it to two. Let's see real quick. Two is error. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so one is a warning. So now there's no red dot, but there's a yellow dot saying, hey, this is a warning. You should probably fix it. So I would use your discretion. Some rules, just turn them off. Other ones, you might, might want to make warnings because you might want to go back to those. Um, but pretty much any rule you find, you can either turn off or on here. Um, and also, like if you go to the ESLint documentation and you find a rule that you like, you can simply enable it in that configuration file. Okay, yeah, ignored files are stored in ESLint ignore. So the idea is you don't want to run your linter on everything. So if we look in here, um, it's not running the linter on any of my configuration files or my build files, simply because like that's not application code, so I don't want to run my linter on that. But you could throw other things in here. Like I could actually throw the entire source directory if I wanted to. 
and then now it'll just ignore, like it won't run the linter on anything. You don't want to do that though. Uh, it is possible. Cool. Yes? Uh, so I, I think by default it won't. So like, um, exactly. I, I think like we could actually test it real quick. So if I uh, let's say I re-enable comma dangle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Now it's an error. Um, when I load the app, it has an error. But let's try to build it. I think the build will just fail if I have errors. So if I do npm run build. Building for production. It, it may it may not. Okay, it, it, so the build just failed entirely. Um, that's you can probably uh, change that in the uh, Webpack config because right now uh, ESLint is the first thing that runs before Babel and before everything else. So there's a there's some configuration in there that says if ESLint fails, just don't even let anything below it run. Um, when we're looking at Webpack, we can see how, potentially how to disable that. Um, but I'm going to add it back because don't like the comma dangle. Let's close some tabs. Get rid of that, and that, and that, and that, and that. Cool. Um, and again, depending on how you generated your project, it may extend a specific config. In my specific case, I said, please extend that one. You can choose others as well. Um, and you can add or disable rules in the rules section. Um, yeah, and uh, I kind of like hinted at this already. Don't rely on Vue to throw the linter error. Like I've seen a lot of people do this, where like you're, you run your code, and then you go to the browser to see that a linter error has been thrown. Um, if I turn that up, I don't know. I could do something like, yeah, I know it hates that. It doesn't like underscores. Um, so, oh, yeah, so uh, it's not camel case. But if I do that, if I didn't have linter enabled inside of Atom, I would go to the browser and it says, oh, uh, is not in the this value is not in camel case. Please fix it. Um, install the plugin in Atom and let that work on your behalf. So. Like instead of like change some code, go to the browser. Oh, I need to fix all this stuff. Fix it while you're in the editor. Like it's telling me it's not camel case. Okay, I'll make it camel case, or at least get rid of the underscore. <laughs> um, and then uh, no error here. And when I go back to the browser, no errors there either. So don't just depend on the browser to show you the errors. Use the plugin. Um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Lastly, Webpack. All right. If you look in this folder, the base webpack config is in this build folder. So if I look at build and I look at webpack base conf, this is the main configuration for, for webpack shared by my development and production build. Now, this webpack config is what describes how to load all of the modules. So at the beginning, I, uh, I described what is a module loader. So let's throw the image back up there. This idea of taking all these disparate modules, whether those are files or images or uh, really anything else, and running those through Webpack, the Webpack config describes what to do when it comes across each of these different file types. So when it comes across a .view file, it needs to turn that into a component, into a, a JavaScript uh, module. When it comes across uh, a JavaScript module, it needs to make that module available to other things inside of it. So the idea is our config is describing what to do when it comes across various things. The first thing you have is your entry point. That's basically saying, this is my main file. Everything else is going to be required, uh, imported out from there. And if we look at main.js, this is the main file for our app. This is the one that actually creates the main view component, um, but it does import app. So you can think of Webpack kind of like crawls like a spider. It goes into this file, it then says, oh, this needs the view module. So it goes and grabs that. Now all of this is kind of in the same file. It says, oh, this needs the app file. So it goes and grabs that. If we look in the app file, oh, this needs the hello component. So it goes and grabs that. Eventually, we're going to end up with a single JavaScript file that has all of this stuff inside of it. Uh, and Webpack has figured that out based on this one entry point. 
Um, there's a lot of other stuff in here, well, in the base config. The one thing that I wanted to show are the rules. And this basically says, hey, Webpack, when you come across this specific file type, this is how, uh, how you know to load that specific thing. So you'll notice the first rule is for view files. Um, well, no, no, sorry. This is the uh, ES lint loader. So before your files are run through Babel, before they're run through the view loader or anything else, they run through ES lint to lengthen. And this is the thing that's throwing those errors. So before anything else can happen down here, if this thing throws an error, like Webpack will immediately stop at that. Next thing down is the view loader. So view allows us to specify our components like this, which is you have a template, a script, and a style all in one file. Um, but the browser doesn't know how to read this. Like, yeah, like something has to happen to this file for the browser to understand what to do with it. So view loader is what takes this and turns it into a JavaScript module. So when Webpack is running, any time it comes across a view file, it runs it through the, uh, the view loader, which turns it into a JavaScript module. Next, it goes through the Babel config. So at this point, we've linted our code, we've converted all of our view components into modules. Now we're going to transpile the code with Babel. Um, and by default, just by specifying Babel loader, it's going to look at our Babel RC for all of the configurations and rules that we uh, brought in with Babel. So we run our code through Babel, and then lastly, if it comes across any other types of assets. So if it comes across um, an image file, it actually uh, copies it over to the uh, static assets path. If it comes across audio files, it does that. If it comes across fonts, it copies the file directly to the fonts directory. Um, but the idea is, any time it comes across any file reference, this is describing what to do with it, whether it's loading it or running it through a transpiler or just like copying that file over. This is the base config. Your development config is defined in this file. And ultimately, it takes all of these settings but adds a few other things. So your development config um, is doing things like printing friendly errors, um, hot module replacement. So you'll notice by default, the page, whenever you change your JavaScript, the page will automatically refresh and like load the latest code. That's this thing happening for you. Um, but when we're running in production, we don't care about that. So if we look at the production config, it doesn't have any of that, but it has lots of other modules that um, provide some optimizations for the browser. So the optimized CSS plugin um, uh, adds like uh, browser presets to uh, like CSS variables, uh, CSS properties. So certain browsers don't directly support like Flexbox or something like that. This is my break timer, and I'm almost done. I've been talking a very long time, but I'll, I'll be done soon. Um, so if you've ever seen uh, like a CSS property that's like webkit-flex or webkit-some other thing, the idea is when I'm writing my CSS inside of my component, I just write it as if it was supported by everything. But then when it runs through this uh, 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 optimize CSS plugin, it adds those extra things so that it's supported by other browsers. Um, yeah, the other thing is uh, extract text plugin. So you probably didn't, I don't have any examples of it, but it's actually with Webpack, it's possible to import a CSS file. Like here I could literally say import styles slash style dot CSS. And then all of the styles defined inside of there would actually be applied to this component. It's possible. But the extract text plugin makes it so that those CSS rules aren't embedded in the JavaScript. They actually get created as a separate CSS file. Wonderful. And lots of other stuff happening. But it's all there if you want to update it. And it's uh, clearly described at the Webpack uh, website. Wow, oh, that was awesome. Let's see that again. <laughs> Hard refresh. Ah, oh, come on. Oh, oh, is it based on like when I'm tapping? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. But if we look at uh, Webpack 2, you can look at the guide. You can see all the different ways to configure these plugins, uh, how to update them. Um, one thing I will point you to, which actually does come into handy, come in handy, are the. Um, hmm.
I'll find it just a second. Plugins. Plugin interfaces. CLI. Guides. Do I have a link to it? I think I might have a link to it in my slides. Yes, custom plugins. Um, this is one thing that you might have to actually do. So Webpack provide plugin. What this allows you to do is specify a global variable that can be used in any other module. So a lot of times uh, you're depending on code that expects jQuery to exist as like a global variable. So what you can do is do a provide plugin. And you would npm install jQuery, just like normal, but what this does is it says, okay, when a module comes across a dollar sign, let that be equal to the module uh, called jQuery that was installed. Or when it comes across jQuery, which is used by um, a lot of libraries, instead of using dollar sign, use the module called jQuery. And then anywhere in your code, you can now use that, and it behaves like it's actually using jQuery. Um, but this provide plugin would simply just be added to the list of plugins here. So you'll notice this is array of plugins. If I wanted to, de to define um, jQuery, I would actually do this in my base config. So if we look on this one, it actually doesn't have any plugins defined, so I can just go ahead and define it. So like plugins is that. And now I would have had to have installed jQuery in my package JSON, but now my app has access to dollar sign and jQuery as a global variable. CJ, yeah. How do you uh, switch out things like, I mean, I know you can acquire it in jQuery right there. How do you switch out, like, I think uh, you resource uses the dollar sign as well. How does, Ooh. like, how does it know, like, when you do HTTP, like, or anything like that, how does it know which one is jQuery or which one is? Oh, so uh, specifically view resource, uh, it prepends the variable with dollar sign, but it's not actually jQuery. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and I think I know what you're talking about, like, um, yeah, so view resource, you might do something like, uh, dollar sign http dot right. get or something like that. Yeah. So this is a variable that begins with dollar sign, not necessarily jQuery. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if if it came across just like dollar sign dot get, which is jQuery Ajax, then it would be looking for the jQuery library. Yeah. Awesome. I think that's all I had to say. I've talked for a very long time. <laughs> thank you all so much for listening. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very much. Uh, yeah, definitely. Any last questions or comments? Or yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming out. Could you all stay seated so I can count how many people were here? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 14 is the next number. 16, 18, 22. Thank you. <laughs>